southern trees Bear strange fruit And the community got, became into an uproar and said that they were tired of the complaints being, uh, having complaints about the police department and feeling like they had no recourse with it, they wanted to have a citizen's review board. Okay. His initial thing was then, oh, I got one of those. Well, no one knew about it. Okay. And then he, he never released the names initially. He just said, I had one. And we don't need another one. And that, but un, he already knew that their capacity was totally different from what this community was calling for. Right. So why throw that out there? Well, we're not being transparent. Then as this, this became a, a snowball that could not be stopped at the time, then he releases the names later on and says some of the members, not all of them at the initial time, but some of the names of the people who were on his advisory board. And one of them happened to be the president of the uh, Mobile Chapter of the NAACP, Mr. Ronald Ali. Now, um, who was also one of the people that the chief said for transparency he had allowed to or requested through the DA's office to allow to view the autopsy. So why do you think that Chief Barber would say, hey, I'm just going to let this guy from the NAACP go in and sit in on the autopsy when he's already basically in Chief Barber's pocket on his advisory board what is it? Do you think it was to bring a calm to the black community? He was using that as a to say, okay, we're gonna let him go sit in. We're trying to show transparency. Or do you think it's something bigger than that? Uh, I'm sure. It, I, I'm just a little fish in this big pond, but I'm sure it's probably something bigger. Uh, I I will say this. It doesn't look well. It doesn't. It, it just doesn't look well, if anything. I don't even know what the purpose of having the NAACP in Mobile is, to be honest with you, because they've been the last people to reach out to me. And, and it's unfortunate because I thought they were supposed to represent civil rights. I thought they should be the ones advocating for my son. That's exactly right. Especially being a young black male in this city. And I'm not getting that from them. Well. The, uh, the day after the, the shooting of Michael, um, Ron Ali was across the street while Michael got shot in. And I happened to walk outside, because like I said before, I was one of the witnesses. And these are the words that Ron Ali told me. He says, what you're saying is didn't happen. I said, no, the police officer shot five times. Ron Ali looked at me and says, he only shot three times. They checked the officer's um, <laughs> gun and he only fired three shots. I said, well, I don't know who told you that information. I said, but I trained with weapons and a, and, a, and a good shooter knows how to count shots. I said, so that didn't happen. He said, well, let me tell you this from the, me sitting in on the autopsy or me being out there, I want to say this to you, go back to New Orleans, let it go. Don't get caught up in this any kind of way. Hey, he was in a stolen car. Let it go. Those are the words that Ron Ali told me. And um, as me and Jimmy Gardner was out there looking, Jimmy happened to see where the, the projectiles ricochet. Mm -hmm. had hit the ground. Mm -hmm. And he gets on the phone. He calls Ron Ali. He says, Mr. Westbrook is correct. Because we have inventions where the projectiles hit the ground. Ron Ali turns around and comes back. And he says, oh, you misunderstood what I was trying to tell you. I'm 52 years old. I fully understood what you was, what Mr. Ali was simply telling me is, stay out of it, let it go. And now I'm beginning to wonder why, or understand better why, is because he's on Chief Barber advisory board. Again, that goes back to what the reports that the chief was giving us as the, to the family initially was, um, well, he was only he only fired three shots, mm -hmm. and. That was on the next day that I spoke with the chief in reference to that, that Tuesday. And I, uh, I told him at that time, I said, no, there was at least four shots that I know of. If there were three in Michael, from what the doctor said right. to me, there was at least four that I know of specifically because I had saw the, the ricochet right. on the ground. Mm -hmm. uh, so 
you're not accurate. That's right. He's no, no, no. He swore down it was only three okay. by counting the rounds that this officer had, and again going off of the officer's words of how many rounds he puts in his clips. Right. Okay. So. Then he had to come back and say, oh no, there was a fourth one. Well, unfortunately, they found four. When he told us it was three, mm -hmm. they had already found four casings That's that right. first night. Mm -hmm. He came back again later in the week and told me, oh, well, it was five. Exactly. How could you not get this right from the get-go when you said you had already investigated and checked how many rounds the officer had, how many rounds that should have been fired, and then you got the casings. The problem was they didn't really fully, thoroughly check the scene. They, well, they, checked, they went off the officer's statement. They went off the officer's statement. They didn't check the scene. What they actually did was they did crowd control. They didn't do an investigation, a crime scene investigation, because they would have been out there all night doing a crime scene investigation. What they did was they grabbed Michael's body up to have Michael's body carried away mm -hmm. to contain the crowd. situation for the crowd. That's, that's correct. Because people were studying, I mean, yet still coming up. So, but you can't do that. Because what, what you have here is Michael's already gone. He arrived uh, dead at the hospital. His, and that's according to the reports. He arrived there with no pulse, no heart rate, everything was zeros. They said he had one to the left chest, um, there's one under his left arm, and then uh, right side. Mm -hmm. There were two on the left and one on the right. Well, I'll say this, yes, the doctor did say that it was a, a hole in the A order, because they did crack his chest open, and they, they found that one of the rounds traveled across him okay. and, 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 and went through the heart. Okay. So, yes, he was deceased. And, and my experience with the department as well as the EMS side here is one of the things about EMS is when you go to a crime scene, we're always taught to ensure we do not tamper with or mess with anything right. within that crime scene that so that the crime scene can be withheld so for further investigation. Mm -hmm. We also have a protocol which is called death in the field, which for a crime scene, if you get there and you find that the person is deceased, you do limited amount of things wanted to ensure that you can document that he is deceased and you get on the phone and you call your medical control doctor and you will get a death in the field approval with a time for death at that point in time but you don't move the body right that way everyone can come in do the appropriate forensics check on this scene and ensure that everything is done and when i spoke with chief barber knowing the things that i do know about it uh <laughs> He told me that was his decision, which is totally wrong. Yeah. A police chief cannot tell that EMS person to remove a body from a crime scene. That's not his call. Well, you know, um, I called Chief Barber on that. At the city council meeting, Chief Barber was not on the scene when Michael was there. He showed up, but he said that he told EMS to, it was his call for EMS to move Michael, unless he got on the, on phone, the phone or radio or something. Or radioed in and told EMS to get that body out of there. Well, he wouldn't talk directly to EMS. He would talk to someone on scene who okay. would relay that to the EMS personnel. Right. I do know EMS protocol, and I right. do know how you handle a crime scene versus a normal situation. Right. Um, and I do know the protocols that are there in place to ensure that people come to uh, uh, the facts, get the facts as it stands. Right. You know, one of the things I was I was hard on Chief Barber about was if there was four, when you told me, okay, you secured there was four casings, but there's only three rounds in, in the body. Where is the fourth round? Right. Most departments, they would not have left that scene until they was absolutely sure they couldn't you know, recover that fourth round. They need to find the trajectory of that round because that's a part of the forensics. That's correct. Where did that, you, you know if the officer was standing at point X and you see a mark in the ground where, where it ricocheted right. and you know that at an angle of 30 degrees that right. that 
ground is only going to arise once it ricochets two feet off the ground, right. you should be able to travel out. That's right. And find that round. Well, they never looked for the round. Of course they didn't. Um, but that that was that's that shows me in either one incompetence or a, a failure to want to find the truth. Chief Barber mentioned it at the uh, city council meeting. He said, "Well, you was there when they did the reconstruction. That wasn't a crime scene reconstruction." And what they did was they used a lever and they used a um, laser. And they, sh they based it on the height of Michael. And they shot that laser from a certain position to say that's what making it consistent with the findings. But that's not true. You just used it as if though Michael was standing when he was shot. That's why I called Chief Barber on and they said, if we have Michael, Michael's 510, we have an elevation. And the officer angles that gun at a certain degree and shoot Michael. Can he not change the direction of that projectile to seem as if though Michael was standing? Chief Harper stood up and said, hey, I'm not here to split hands with you. I agree. You can change the direction of the projectile. And the purpose of me bringing that up is if that is the case and the witnesses are saying he stood over Michael and assassinated him, why is Chief Barber constantly saying he shot Michael twice while he was standing, the third time Michael was reaching for a weapon and he shot him again? Okay, if that is true, why were there five shots? Facts are facts. Let's, let's go back. You, you brought up the, uh, the, uh, the witness who was actually a Caucasian male who parked his car behind the officer's car. That's correct. And he took, he didn't get video, but he took several steel pictures. Steel pictures. That's right. Look at the steel pictures. I, I, I happened to get a look, a glimpse of the steel pictures uh, off of somewhere online that he had put uh, a video together, but it had the picture in there and I, I got to look at the picture. And if you, if you look at the picture alone, you could, what you're saying is absolutely true because you could see the angle of the officer's forearm. That's exactly right. Standing over Michael. That's right. And his head was actually, it's funny that you said it earlier, yeah. was looking back at you guys. That's exactly what he was looking at. Back at, across, across the street. The time it took for him to observe me, to make sure I wasn't a threat, and my godmother and the other lady out there wasn't a threat, and for him to turn back to Michael after shooting him the first time, and bust out four more rounds. And I told this to the FBI. I said, that's intentional. Because he had enough time to realize that Michael wasn't threat. Because if Michael was reaching for a gun, when he turned his head, he could have been shot. Just, if he had, like you say, if he had the weapon on him and whatnot, he fired on him, he shot him and, and, and killed him laying down there. He went up to him and handcuffed him. That's right. Rolled him over and handcuffed him. never retrieved him. the weapon. But never took a weapon off of the scene. And my thing was, I wanted to see, was it justifiable? Why did he shoot him? Because he couldn't have been shooting because he was bagging up, because that's not a reason to shoot him. And his hands is up. And even if Michael would have had a weapon on his right side, he had a cell phone in his hand. And I've said this to <laughs> the FBI. Michael wow. would have had to have been wider, or a Billy the Kid, to have a man already got a weapon trained on you, drop a cell phone, draw that weapon, shoot that police, and be able to shoot that police officer. Let's go, let's go even more. Let's, let's, let's take the facts on. You just said what they changed a couple times as to where the position of the weapon was. Mm -hmm. Supposedly, one time, Chief told me initially, he gestured that the weapon was here. So if Michael was facing the officer and his shirt moved and he saw a weapon, okay. But then later on, they said that the weapon was on the right side. If the weapon was on the right side, how could they find it up under him at the hospital? That's correct. That's correct. That's correct. Tucked in his back. 